Good. So bef before we uh, do anything else, I did want to make a quick shout out to uh, Doug McLeod and the RTD staff for the refinancing, which some of you may not have heard all the details of, but over a five-year period, uh, there's about $126 million savings. Uh, the average interest rate for the refinancing is 2.2%, which is pretty outstanding. So great work there. With that, I suppose we're going to go to approving the minutes of our meetings. Day, you want to start? Day, are you muted? Oh, can you hear me? Okay. I can. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, just to give a little bit of context, this is a joint meeting between the Finance and the Operations Committee, so welcome. Um, I want to make sure that the Operations Committee has had a chance to review their uh, meeting summary from the March 3rd meeting, and if there's any specific questions that folks might have, um, please direct those over to the um, Dr. Cog staff. I just want to check in briefly. Are there any questions from members of the Operations Committee on the minutes before we move on to the next item on the agenda? All right, I hear Okay, no I'll say the same thing for the Finance Committee. Uh, I read through the minutes and as usual, they're pretty pretty well done, I thought, and accurate. I didn't see anything, but if anybody else did, now's your chance to speak up. Not hearing any further comments, uh, I think we'll move on to the rest of our rather full 25 page agenda for today. <laughs> So um, debrief of governance recommendations, Ron Pastorf, Papstorf is the, the person who is uh, on the agenda to talk about that. And this is uh, basically just going over uh, the governance recommendations as they currently stand and allowing us to provide input if we wish to. Ron? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Rhett. Um, yeah, no, I can I can kick this off, but there are several people here in attendance this morning that were involved in the conversation at the governance subcommittee meeting Monday afternoon. And, you know, I think we just wanted to get this in front of all of you so that if there were people that haven't been tracking on this um, yet, they had a chance to see this and review this. Um, I think um, uh, uh Julie Mullica, who chairs the governance subcommittee, and Doug Rex um, intend to sort of bring this forward to the full RTD accountability committee meeting uh, in April for further conversation. So just wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to see this and, and review this. So we did include this uh, initial recommendation um, in the packet. I've got that up on the screen now, so you should at least be able to see that. But the, the gist of the recommendation um, is to list some um, specific concepts about the intent of creating a sub-regional service council structure uh, to improve collaboration between RTD and the communities that RTD serves, uh, to increase opportunities for public input through uh, locally accessible forums uh, that are smaller than sort of the entire RTD district, to advance uh, social equity goals by developing community-based transit plans that identify transportation service gaps, especially in lower income and minority neighborhoods, um, to promote innovative mobility solutions at a local level, um, consistent with RTD board's overall service goals and objectives. So I think the a core of this uh, concept is that RTD boards and RTD will still set broad service goals for the entire district that would, would still kind of provide a framework for these local, the sub-regional service councils. And then to provide an opportunity to address geographic equity and rebuild trust and transparency uh, with RTD's constituents around the region. Um, there's some um, specific um, uh, structural elements related to membership so that membership is made up of elected officials as well as um, a broad spectrum of other interests um, uh, to ensure so social, economic, financial, and environmental equity uh, considerations and make sure that transit users um, are represented on the membership of those um, service councils. Uh, when it comes to the geography of the service councils, uh, right now, the way this is structured uh, really sort of 
um, lays out some options, um, but doesn't recommend a specific option. And, and really um, the point is to recommend to RT, RTD itself to kind of carry this forward once this becomes a final recommendation uh, in the final report of the accountability committee to look for, to explore these options and really come forward with its own decisions about what fits best uh, through a process that engages with um, interest groups from throughout the region to inform that decision making. So there's one concept that's uh, kind of organized organizes the, the geography around county boundaries. Uh, this is similar to uh, what Dr. Cog has in place in terms of its transportation uh, sub-regional forums that we created a couple of years ago uh, that are organized around county geographies. And then another, another option is really looking at sort of travel sheds uh, within the RTD service territory uh, and which might result in some geographies that are bigger than county boundaries or smaller than county boundaries, kind of reflecting some different travel sheds and trying to um, identify uh, geographies that might um, uh, create, create areas that sort of have similar travel patterns or, or transportation needs in, in relation to RTD services. And then uh, uh, this piece relates to the RTD uh, service allocation. Um, which is acknowledging that um, you know one critical role that RTD plays uh, in fulfilling mobility needs of the Denver area residents, um, and there's some certain uh, taxpayer interest in having more information about how uh, the taxes that they pay into the RTD services are used to create sort of an, an equitable transit system, particularly around geographic equity, um, but also acknowledging that you know everyone within our, the RTD district benefits from being part of and having access to the entire RTD service territory. And so uh, just um, an, uh, an acknowledgement that there is a need to uh, kind of use the service councils to, to look at service uh, allocate or the, those resource allocations um, in, in these considerations. So we wanted to get that in front of you. Um, acknowledge that, you know, we did attach the RTD accountability committee equity assessment framework uh, for this. And uh, based on the accountability committee's work at their last meeting, um, this work this work of uh, completing the equity assessment will be a joint effort between um, Mile High Connects and the consultants um, uh, North Highland. So with that framework, happy to open it up. Any other observations or comments uh, from folks that were in attendance, in, in attendance Monday, I think would be welcome. I Ms. have a comment. Raising her hand. I don't know if you can see her, Ron. <laughs> She's there. Always. <laughs> so this is a, a, an issue that had been flagged for me recently that I don't think I've brought up in the past. But one of the potential benefits, which I have raised before, of doing local service councils is it you know, rebuilds that trust and helps give local voice to the, the local transit system that feeds into the larger regional transit system, which then could lead to leveraging local resources. One fear that comes up if and when that happens is that um, if you contribute locally that somehow your allocation of, of, of benefit or resources from RTD then might be decreased because you've added to that pot. And so making sure that there's not any um, loss of resources if this works as we'd like and communities just decide that it's worthwhile contributing to, to enhance the system that then they won't be penalized by then having their RTD allocation of benefits somehow reduced. I'm wondering if that's a concept that we might include in the, the resource allocation paragraph at the bottom. And just curious, I'd love to hear people's impact, uh, input on whether or not they think that is, is a worthwhile issue to flag. I think it is, Elise. It's a complicated issue, though, in that the, the poorest communities are the least likely to be able to uh, provide that kind of 
get in those partnerships. On the other hand, without something like that, it really discourages partnerships. Oh, we won't partner. We'll just we'll just let RTD take care of it. So it's kind of a complicated uh, issue in in that sense. I agree that equity. You know, we're driving with equity in a lot of this, and we need to do better by poor communities. But I mean, even look at you know partners with the private sector. If they step up, for example, a new employer in a poor or rich neighborhood to help with mobility for their employees, they shouldn't then, there shouldn't be then a, a net loss of RTD transit because a private sector partner stepped up. Um, I, I think it would have a chilling effect on anybody trying to add benefit to the system if then um, there's a net loss uh, at the back end for any community, regardless of you know, the socioeconomic status. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that you've been a real champion of partnerships. And I think that that now, anytime we look at any situation, the first thing is what's, where are the potential partnerships? And you don't want to do anything to chill those. But I don't, you know, I don't think adding something like that would, I don't know if you qualify it or what, but in the, in the last paragraph, as you mentioned, I think that might be beneficial. I, we probably want broader input on it, but we got two thirds of the committees here, <laughs> subcommittees, and I'm sure it can be discussed again at the uh, larger gathering. Dad, do you have any feeling about that? I don't mean to hog yeah. the mic. No, I was just gonna add, um... I agree with Elise. That was one question that I, as I was reading through this, uh, it kept coming up for me is how, how, how does this affect local communities? There's not like, what's the financial implications? Do we have any financial or do we expect any financial implications? Um, I'm also wondering, uh, it, this doesn't really lay out the relationship between the board, the RTD board and the, um, and these sub councils. Um, and I don't know if that's if that's something that we'd need to explore a little bit more and maybe what the board's responsibility is even over in overseeing some of the financial um, impacts of the, the sub-regional councils. I think that's a good observation. Daya, I agree. I would agree with that, and um, I just add that that uh, I've had several people from the board mention that that the membership doesn't include board members or uh, sort of the concept. And certainly, you know, the idea I think here is that that they would be part of of uh, any of these that they overlap with, and at least I I would hope so. I think that's of interest. Um, we have a special board meeting set for next Tuesday night that is intended to do two things. One is to, um, uh, what we expect is the board's support for the accountability committee's bill that's been introduced and, and there's some amendments pending that would, would be included as well. Um, and the other one is to discuss these local service councils. So I, at this point, I don't have, I've had feedback from a number of people, but not directly a, a board feedback. And I will have that before the accountability committee meets as a whole. Um, I can say that in terms of the suggestion of creating a stakeholder group, of RTD creating a work group of, of stakeholders to decide sort of the geography and potentially some of these other things, um, that uh, I'm hearing from some board members, I've also heard from one TMA, and I was told that there would be other TMAs and, and uh, local coordinating councils weighing in that, uh, you know, with thoughts about how, what the geography should be and how this should be run. So um, I think, I guess I would support that idea specifically that, that we um, have RTD create a work group of stakeholders because I think there are voices out there that, that think it should be a county or travel shed and just wanna be part of how, how this is decided. Right. I, I also just wanted to add, I think one additional framing for this um, 
for this recommendation is is really looking at it as as an opportunity. What does this what does transferring some of the 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 work of the board really free up the board to do when it comes to to operating RTD from this thirty thousand foot view, right? This group, the the subregional service councils, could be the ones that provide the recommendations and and really focus on the on the ground work. But really, this frees up the board to do what a board is intended to do, which is policy, establish policy, and really guide the overall direction of the organization. Um, so I just want to encourage that as a framing. I think another thing that I just want to lift up in terms of membership, I, I really appreciate having transit users, transit riders um, as part of the, the membership. I think that's a valuable voice uh, that I know RTD has several committees where they, where they seek out input from community, but to see it um, in this way is also very reassuring. I am kind of curious if, and this will be more of an implementation conversation for RTD, but if there's any intent to um, to put bumper lanes <laughs> on the, the size of the membership, because I could certainly see this becoming very unwieldy um, if it's just, if, if there is no um, set number of, of what the minimum is, the number minimum number of folks that we want from each of these um, audiences, elected representatives, folks, transit users, and then what's the, the bottom and then what's the top? Like wh what are those bumper lanes that we need to operate within? Yeah, I, I'd just like to point out that that uh, we are the accountability committee. We make recommendations. We don't, we cannot dictate in any way to RTD how they implement things. So in the end, uh, I think our recommendations are really important that we get them as close to what's going to work as possible. But in the end, it's RTD that's going to wind up having to carry the ball on all of this. Rod, I do see that um, Julie Mullica has her hand up. Oh, hi, Julie. Welcome. <laughs> hey, you. Can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome. So I just wanted to, um, uh, d I did want to agree with Lynn. I, you know, originally when I always read the membership, I just assumed that the elected representatives included the RTD directors <laughs> that are pertainable to right to that district. So it might be good just to kind of call that out um, under membership. I always anticipated um, you know, the RTD directors holding a large role um, when it comes to these service councils. And so I think that it's important to, to um, pull that out. And then, um, you know, to some of uh, Dan's and some other conversations um, that I heard is, you know, I think that the, the stakeholder group has a lot to kind of shift through, um, right? Because we don't have, like what was just saying, we don't have the ability to really kind of parse out that resource allocation work as well as um, you know, some of those other implementation factors. And so um, I really feel like this, this stakeholder group is gonna have to be robust and, and really diverse. And so I'm hoping that RTD um, you know, will go along in the spirit of that, I'm, I'm assuming that they would. Um, and then as for transit users, one conversation that did come up on Monday um, was how do you incentivize, you know, average people to participate um, in, you know, the service council? Like, is there perhaps RTD passes that we could give or other incentives that we could provide community members for their time in participating in this group and their feedback, because we want to make sure that, you know, the platform is something that's accessible to them as well as, you know, compensation for their time or something. So I, that's also something that the work, um, the stakeholder group is going to have to try and, and figure out is what incentives are going to be needed to really get those diverse voices and perspectives on this board. And what does it, how, how is that going to, to work out? So, um, yeah, I agree that there's so many more details of this entire plan that needs to be worked out. Um, but if anything, it provides, you know, a framework or a vision, if you will, um, of the direction that we think it would be very helpful um, for, for getting that kind of local perspective in our team. Um, so that's all I wanted to share is just a little bit from our conversation on Monday, but thank you guys for your, for your comments. Um, I love this discussion. Thanks. <laughs> all right. 
Rod, I see that Deborah has her hand up. Oh, good. I'm sorry, good. Deborah, I missed that. By all means. No worries. Good morning. And I want to thank um, Julie for her comments. During the course of Monday's meeting, I did share some thoughts that my team and I had um, come to recognizing that we support in concept the proposal. But as it relates to the conversation comprising membership, one thing that I stated on Monday, and I'll reiterate for this group that's assembled here today, that it's imperative when you put together a group like this, having recognized that I've been involved with the group here and something similar, um, gosh, about 15 years ago when I was in Washington uh, Metro being WMATA, that we have to ensure that the customer's voice is heard. In order to deliver the transit services that are needed to the vast majority of which who need them to get to places, activity centers and things of the like, we have to understand what their pain points are because they're the ones out there that are utilizing the service that may not be able to get to a job and may be on the brink of losing their job if the service is not on time and they can punch a clock or do whatever else they need to do to ensure the quality of life and to establish and maintain their livelihood. So with that as a backdrop too, recognizing that this is a framework, um, it's incumbent upon all of us to basically have an understanding within each classification what the allocation would be for said seats, but more so to Julie's point, talking about a diverse group, when we put together this stakeholder group to evaluate this, one thing that I'm going to advocate for to ensure that comes to fruition is basically having eligibility criteria in which to participate. I want to ensure that we're having people that utilize the system that perhaps, and I'm not going to frame what that is now because I think it's imperative upon us to engage with people to understand set pain points whereby then we can qualify what that criteria is. Because one thing that I found for certain when you get filtered information and you have somebody that hasn't utilized the system or understood what it's like to wait out in the dark for a mode of transport to come that doesn't arrive, there's a whole different perspective when we're talking about inlining services basically what time points are and um, how many runs we have on said route or line. So I just wanted to offer that up because I think it's imperative to make this a successful tool whereby we can hear the voices of the people that understand the interdependencies of all of this and how this will help shape the voice that we need to hear from relative to the service delivery in this region. Thanks. Well, that's about, if we're going to keep on schedule, the allotted time. So uh, if, if there aren't any more comments, shall we move ahead? Yes, Ali. Just for folks who weren't a part of Monday's conversation, Boulder County did provide a, a document of comments that um, folks should avail themselves of about their desire, their preference for a county-based um, geography and if the stakeholder group and RTD chose otherwise to be considered their own travel shed given that 88% of the transit use in the county originates and ends in that county sort of creating some unique circumstances. So I just want to draw people to those comments, draw people's sure. attention. Yeah. Day, are you ready to move ahead? I am. Thanks, Rhett. Um, Great, so thank you everyone. Uh, just as a reminder, this is a joint committee meeting between the operations and the finance committee. Um, given the conversation that we were having at our operations committee a couple of weeks ago, um, really focusing on the, the development of a dashboard, which aligns very nicely with the work that was already happening within the operation or the finance committee. So um, rather than hosting two meetings with the same topic, one meeting um, seemed to be the best and most effective use of our time. Um, so with that, I want to start out by um, bringing on Natalie Shishido with CDOT, who will provide a brief overview of performance measures um, based on some research that she was able to pull, just looking at peer agencies and what metrics they may be using. As a reminder for the committee, the purpose of this is again to formulate our recommendation that we would then present to RTD in acknowledgement and recognition that um, General Manager Deborah Johnson has done uh, a lot of work internally to really frame and, and build that conversation within RTD. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Natalie. Natalie, you're muted. Now you're not. Good. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Sam. Um, so yeah, I'm basically just going to um, share a couple of examples of different um, performance dashboards from um, other transit agencies. Um, 
And you can take a look at some of the performance measures that they choose to display and how they choose to display them as well. So um, this is Capital Metro in Austin, Texas. Um, so as you can see, they have their customers or ridership, safety report, reliability, finance report, route performance, and COVID response. Can everybody see my screen? Also, I didn't check. Okay, great. Um, so when you go into some of these categories, wait a minute to load. You can take a look at some of the specific metrics that they're displaying. Um, taking a minute, <laughs> sorry. Um, and how they're doing it. So this is a dynamic display. So you can um, edit the different inputs. And I think that's probably partly what's taking it so long, but. Um, we go. Um, so here you can see how they're displaying their month by month ridership, um, ridership by type of service, um, year by year trend um, and comparison, um, and then by separate um, mode of transportation as well. Um, and then they have different um, different displays for each one of those categories that they had. And then I'll show you, this is um, a dashboard for um, the Chicago Metro. Um, this is specifically focused on COVID, um, so maybe a little bit less relevant. Um, but as you can see, they're using a map here to display um, route status. And then they have their ridership and their stats as well. And then this is TriMet in Portland. And this is a little bit more of a static display of um, their performance metrics. Um, and you, they have ridership, efficiency, budget, safety, and um, a tab for their data as well. And so they have weekly boarding rides on their bus and max light rail system. Um, and then they have their lift and cab um, but so by different mode, efficiency, so operating cost per boarding ride, um, again, broken out by mode, on time performance, and they have their budget information. And if you're scrolling around here, you, it'll just show you, but you can't exactly put in different information like the, um, Capital Metro page. Um, and then safety information, and then you can access their data through Excel files as well. And then the last one I'll show you, this is um, King County Metro. Um, this is their rider dash. Um, and this also has quite a bit of manipulation you can do. You can go through their um, different areas. They have um, routes, ridership impact, they have specifically rider mask use. Um, so definitely a COVID focus here as well. And that is all I have. Go ahead. Natalie, I've got one quick question. Um, are these uh, commercial apps that these things are based on? Is the underlying uh, technology to create these, is it homegrown in each one of these uh, uh, transit companies or is it using some specific package? Rebecca, so, you might know that or Natalie might know that, whoever does. Yeah, a couple of these are using uh, Microsoft Power BI as you can see down here. Um, that's the software that they're using. Um, I think the Chicago was using Arc GIS. Um, so they're using software. Um, commercial software product. I'm assuming it's purchased, yeah. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, the idea of, of writing some of this code and trying to maintain it 
is a really bad idea for a transit agency, as opposed to finding some good commercial product that they can base it on. The decision of what product you pick is a big, big deal. It isn't just about cost. It's about usability and, uh, and usability, both for the community and for RTD and populating data into these systems. Yeah, I, I did have a, another question, Natalie, in terms of, um, I have a couple of questions in terms of the data itself. Um, I believe on the Austin Capital Metro, it, it showed the data being pulled in a couple of different ways. I, if I remember correctly, monthly, quarterly, and then annually. Do you have a sense of when the others update or how regularly the others update their data? Is it done on a quarterly, monthly basis? Any? I think a lot of them um, do it on a monthly basis. Um, that seems to be pretty um, typical for a lot of them. Okay. The other question that I have is um, from what I remember with King County, their metrics out align to their overall organizational strategic plan and, and broader um, vision for the organization. I'm curious, did you find that with the other agencies, um, Natalie, does it connect to, for example, Capital Metro, connect back to their strategic plan, or really, I, even if RTD happens to know this answer, given Deborah's um, expertise? If I, if I may, so the one from Chicago is done by the Regional Transportation Agency. So you have CTA, which is Chicago Transit Agency, you have PACE, which is a suburban, and then you have Metro, which is commuter rail. So it's the regional planning transit, the regional planning agency that's basically taking that information. So I would surmise relative to what it is, like most MPOs do in various regions, they're collecting it to show holistically what the ridership is. Um, recognizing Microsoft Power BI, I did use that at my last agency as we looked at some of our um, quarterly performance metrics. Um, so there's a myriad of different ways, but looking at the regional aspect, you're gonna have to compare apples to apples and not apples to fish. So with that as the backdrop, um, I would surmise it's not tied to their strategic goals. And just for everybody's edification, what I'm trying to do here is create alignment and tie that to our goals. So it's more of a scorecard so you can see how we're performing. And that's our strategic planning initiative that we're gonna get going in a couple of weeks here. So thanks. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, quick check-in with members of the committee. Any other questions, clarifications, or um, thoughts or reflections before for Natalie before we move on to the next piece? We, we have time too, Rebecca. I wonder if you might uh, make some comments as well. I know you've kind of been carrying the ball from our committee's perspective with Natalie's support. Um, I, I don't have a lot to add. I think this is helpful. And, um, you know, again, I, I think we need to be thinking both about the, the performance metrics and dashboards and just overall um, transparency around uh, spending and, and funding priorities. There's a lot of overlap there, but um, I think Daya and I should just probably continue to stay closely connected as we develop these recommendations and make sure we're, we're thinking across that full landscape. Terrific. Lisa? Uh, just a couple of things as we went through those. I think it's always important to put, um, make sure the context for a particular metric is, is indicated with the dashboard. So, you know, if you just throw a number out there, maybe people have their own opinions about what that number is, but ideally it's pegged to some goal. So you can actually see the metric up there and know whether the agency is performing as desired or not. So that's one. And two, has there been any process or will there be any process with RTD or with these peer agencies of asking the public what metrics they want to see because they may not, I, I think metrics probably um, serve different functions for different people. What the RTD board say or key stakeholders want to see and know about might be more insider baseball than what the average transit user on the street wants to know. And, and so I think it would be important to make sure that we're also displaying metrics that are relevant to the public users. I, I just want to emphasize how much I support that that comment. Um, I, I think that for the average person to go into a dashboard 
some of these dashboards are just too intimidating. And it, it's almost like we need, you know, a, a, a subversion of this for the public with the public having full access to the other one as well but something that's just a lot simpler to get around in. Navi the ability to navigate a dashboard is not something that's a, that's a skill for the average RTD user. It would be nice if they had something that was simple enough that they really could get the information they care about the most without putting any extra burden on RTD in terms of populating it, because it would populate from the bigger dashboard. Mm -hmm. I, um... Just in my own kind of glance at, at the Metro, I really like how they, ascend, I think to lift up your point, Elise, they put the data out there and then what is the data trying to tell me, right? It kind of adds a little bit more detail in a narrative and I fully understand how complicated that is and on a much smaller scale for the various dashboards that we have put together and the data platforms that we've put together. But I, I do want to lift that up, like how do we, what is the story um, or what's the, the data trying to tell me without making it too complicated for the end user, that customer to really understand what is this, how does this ultimately impact me? What does it really mean to me as I'm getting on the 15 or as I'm getting on, you know, the, I don't know, the FF5 or something like that? Like, what does it really mean to me? Um, yeah, I just want to share that. All right, so we have a lot of time. There's definitely some, some additional room for conversation. So I just wanna continue the, the, the dialogue with this group and especially as we think about what the recommendations are, um, both looking at the performance, but also the financial impacts and then ultimately how does this information reach out to the com uh, community? Um, so with that, I just wanna share that at the, um, again, as a reminder at the, uh, early March operations committee, we had a conversation around what some operational metrics might be. And based on that conversation, um, really started to formulate some potential recommendations. Um, we wanted to bring in the North Highlands staff to help us uh, get some consensus around what some potential metrics or, or important items to measure might be. Um, and so I wanna check in with Matthew just to verify that we have the North Highlands staff with us today um, to be able to facilitate a portion of this conversation. That's correct, Daya. They're, they're both here. Great. Um, All right. Well, I will turn it over to Tanya to handle this part. Thanks, Tanya. Great. Thank you very much. And we also have on the line Anna Daniger, um, who's with us here today. She has a lot of expertise in this area, so I think um, you'll find her, um, her input very helpful. So I'm sure she'll be chiming in from time to time. We did prepare just a couple of slides to get the discussion started. So I'll do a quick screen share here. And let me go into slideshow mode. Oh, perhaps. Okay. All right, can you all see okay? We can see it, Tanya, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so just a, a little bit of uh, food for thought to, to kind of get us going here and, and getting your input. Um, you know, when we talk about performance metrics, um, similar to what you all were saying before, they do typically align to strategic goals. So there should be, you know, a clear number of metrics that tie directly to the strategic goals. And as we uh, have heard, RDT is, is uh, about to kick off their strategic plan. Um, and those goals and initiatives, you know, they're, they're measures of, you know, how close are you getting to, to what your initiative is, right? Um, so we pulled uh, two samples post-COVID. <laughs> it's kind of difficult these days to find a, a post-COVID strategic plan, but we were able to find two here of, um, you know, this, the, the top one here from um, the SEPTA strategic plan, which was published just a couple of weeks ago, um, where they're measuring safety according to lost time. And it ties to their goal here that you see, um, you know, safety is paramount in everything we do. Um, and so kind of maintaining that, that uh, goal of uh, safety for employees. And then in terms of, you know, rider accessibility and, and, and connectivity, you see LA Metro's uh, vision plan, uh, which was published, I think late last year, if I recall correctly. Um, you know, they're, they want to know how many transfers does a rider have to make to complete a trip. And this connects to 
uh, their goal of providing seamless journeys. So uh, a couple of, uh, of, of um, you know, uh, direct metrics that are measurable um, and connect directly to initiatives um, through the strategic plan. So, you know, some overarching goals across all of transit that, that we're seeing is, you know, how, how do you measure ridership? Are you looking at the number of riders? Are you looking at the cost per ride? Um, are you looking at, similar to LA Metro, the number of transfers? Also a, a theme across all agencies is equity. So what does equity look like? Is that a, a straight convenient trip as you see at the top of that graphic there or one where you eventually get where you're going, but it, it takes you quite a while to get there. Um, and of course, something we hear in uh, the RTD accountability committee meetings, um, you know, what is the funding and what is the, the uh, accountability around that and, and making sure that metrics are reported um, related to financial stability, stability. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, safety is another overarching theme. Safety of riders, safety of their uh, of, of agency employees and neighbors, of course. So where you have um, you know, transit facilities, are, are they safe, are they sustainable, are they non-toxic, that sort of thing. So the last slide here is really just to kind of get you all thinking and, and what we're what we'd like to hear from you today is, you know, think a, a little bit about what is it that RTD is here to do, because that ultimately determines what you want to measure. Right. So um, and, you know, listening to you all speak at, at various meetings and coming through meeting minutes. You know, we found um, some, you know, you see the bullet points there about some, um, you know, ideas that you all have been um, kind of kind of uh, discussing, you know, um, accessibility, um, growing ridership, um, you know, supporting the environmental health of the region. So what we'd really like to do is, is kind of hear from your perspective, you know, what is it that you all feel RTD is, is really here to do? How do they support the region? Um, there's moving people, there's moving people safely, there's contributing economically to the community. Um, there, there's lots of, of goals here that, that you know, RTD could accomplish, but I think in terms of determining what metrics would be helpful, it would be helpful to kind of start discussing what you all feel you know, RTD is, is really in the region to do. I, I just want to do a quick clarification check in. Now, that is a question for the committee. Is that correct? Tanya? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, for, for, yeah. for all committee members. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I just wanted to make a point about um, some of these metrics. The measure of them is difficult in a lot of cases. But, you know, Peter Drucker always said if you want to manage something, you must first measure it. And it's absolutely true in, in, in RTD as much as it is in any business. And, uh, and there are things like, what is a person's total travel time? That is really matters a lot to a transit user. But it's a, not an easy thing always uh, to measure, but it's the sort of thing that we really need to be able to get our arms around because if we want to improve service to a lot of people, that's what it means. And so uh, the number of transfers, it's another great example. You know, we have a bus system that's sort of in a, this isn't entirely true, but it tends to be in a, a grid of east, west, north, south, roughly. And so you've got to always, almost always make a transfer in order to get to the next stop. And if you miss a transfer, depending on time of day, that really puts you late for work, you know, threatens your lie up your your job and uh, those are the kind of metrics even if they are difficult we really have to figure out how we're going to measure them and maybe it's a matter of, of electronics on buses and trains and things like that Anna well I you know thank you very much I think you make a great point which is those are great measures for the goal of promoting accessibility right um, I mean that's the underlying topic that you're looking at measuring um, and so I think that's where we were trying to go is um, clearly then that is one that is important, right? Is promoting accessibility. Are there other 
um, overarching goals that are critical for the system that you would then want to measure. And then as we as we go from the goals to the measures themselves, to your point, some of these are, are very difficult to measure, but also don't change a great deal over time. Others do. So if we talk about you know number of transfers, the likelihood that that is going to change on a month to month basis is low. That's one where you know maybe quarterly, maybe even twice a year, you update that measure. Um, impact on um, the economy of the region would be another one. Now, certainly we haven't talked about that that's an important goal yet. <laughs> um, so I'm jumping ahead, but if that were one that you all said, yeah, in, in, in fact, something that is a critical um, for RTD, um, then um, the measure for that, again, is rather complex. You have to kind of do a study rather than just pull a bunch of data together. Um, so again, it might be one that you update every six months instead of on a monthly or even a quarterly basis. Um, but if you're talking about um, ridership or fare box or, um, or um, delays, those sorts of things absolutely can be updated on a monthly basis. So, um, so I think what we're going to likely end up with is a set of measures that don't have the same um, frequency of update um, and that, that might look a little different one to another depending on how they align to the goals that, that are critical. Elise, as you've got your hand raised. This is a really good question. I pr appreciate it being asked. The, these are great categories you have, but embedded with each category are really important subcategories. I'm not sure at the end of the day, we can measure 30 different things and display them. So there'll be a vetting, but for example, under accessibility, part of access is, you know, the transfer issue, part of its affordability. Um, so there's different key elements under that. I think ridership overall is one of the key metrics, but I also think that um, we're gonna probably wanna segment, um, I think the equity question is gonna come up and we need to be able to answer it in terms of our, how much of our ridership, how much of the transit reliant population is being served as well as ridership overall. And then under environmental health, I think that there's a couple of different important metrics there. Um, in order to attract resources and get credit for what's happening in this global context, we need to be measuring how much um, RTD is um, reducing or um, preventing the need for a greenhouse gas expenditures. So, and so I think that that's something that we're gonna wanna be measuring as an agency to get credit as, for it being a climate solution, right? Because the state's measuring it, the state has targets, we're trying to attract federal dollars, we need to measure that. Um, I think it's also relevant if we can come up with a metric, we're out of attainment with ozone, we're going into severe non-attainment, which has all sorts of ramifications, including public health, being able to measure the impact of people riding transit on reducing that is going to be key. And I think um, being able to translate what ridership does in terms of taking single occupant vehicles off the road would also be a useful metric, serving a slightly different role than whether or not RTD is doing a good job, but telling the story of RTD's benefits to the, to the region. I think we're going to want to do that as well. Did that make any sense? Makes perfect Very sense. Yes. I, I do want to add just um, while folks are, are kind of digesting this question and kind of thinking through what some <clears throat> potential measures are. I mean, I, I would love to see getting back to that question of what does ridership look like, but you know, really easy to understand, like well, what are the top routes? <laughs> um, I think we all know that. And if you dig into the data, we, we understand that, but especially for communities, and in terms of safety in a public health crisis, just giving folks a sense of like, what is the frequency look like and how often are we meeting those met, uh, metrics um, and providing those, those additional buses to keep folks safe during COVID um, and do it in a way that's, I think, external facing and easy to understand. Um, under, I, 
I always struggle with this idea of customer, positive customer service and what that looks like. So I'm wondering, Tanya or Anna, could you give us an example just in what you've seen um, nationally and what that might look like? Sure. Um, so uh, SEPTA and MJ Transit, they do regular customer service satisfaction surveys. Um, they're online surveys, so they are a, a bit biased, but they also do deploy field staff at um, some of the you know, large stops and transit centers to kind of get on the ground um, um, feedback as well. But they maintain that on um, a regular basis, both um, have seen quarterly and annual to kind of measure their progress and if they are meeting their customers' needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Another thing just as an aside that um, at least one transit does is, um, although I think probably many do, um, is they have the social listening groups. So they're monitoring always what is being tweeted about them. Um, and then they can look at the trends of whether the tweets are more often positive or negative. And if they're going negative, um, how many negative tweets there are and in what given period, right? Because that gives a good indication of what is the, the sort of general um, customer satisfaction. Um, and then another one that's a, um, just sort of a, uh, um, not a measure, but, but data, I guess I'd say, around that is how quickly are complaints or tweets that are um, negative tweets responded to, um, because that often gets to then whether you are engaging the customers with the right um, speed to quell any potential dissatisfaction. Deborah, yes. May I ask a quick question? Thank you. So in relationship to what you all just said regarding, you know, um, the customer satisfaction surveys, wanted to know, did you look at any agencies that were actually leveraging net promoter scores? Is that something in Fortune 500 companies that they utilize? And then more so when you're talking about looking at tweaks, you're talking about, you know, uh, data analytics going in to look at your traffic on the, so was all that encompassed in relative to that because recognizing there's a different thing, a difference between service and satisfaction. So it's where those two meet and leveraging, you know, an NPS would be helpful. And I know there are some agencies within the transportation in industry that have recently um, leveraged those going forward. Sure, and Deborah, thank you very much for asking the question because it gives us an opportunity to sort of talk about the process um, that we didn't do at the beginning of this. Um, and our process as we're engaging in the measures um, component of work here is that um, we, this is really our first step is to find out, you know, kind of what are the critical things that the group thinks ought to be measured. Um, because, you know, you can measure everything um, and have those have no meaning, or you can measure a narrow group of things. So what we wanna get to um, here is really the question of what are the goals that, that, the, t you know, that, that the group think we ought to, to find measures around? Is it managing assets? Is it accessibility? Is it environmental health? This list of things, we wanted to have this discussion first, and then we will go out and do the research and come back. So this really is like day one. <laughs> this work for us. So what we're suggesting are things that we know have been done in other places is maybe a little bit of, of um, research prior to this conversation, but also because we've worked with a lot of other properties, it's not because this is anything close to our final report or our recommendations. This is really our, our first step of information gathering. Oh, no, I appreciate that. I was just asking the question due to the fact that the conversation had ensued relative to customer surveys. So, no, I appreciate the work that you all are doing. And I would just say in relationship to that, I look forward to hearing about that because quite naturally when you do surveys, you're just doing, you know, um, a small microcosm of the vast ridership. So if you catch somebody on a good day, it's all subjective going forward. And Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and leveraging like an MPS. That's why I was just wondering. Um, thanks. I, I think I see Ron's hand up. Go for it, Ron. Thanks. I was, um, I, I'm surprised no one's mentioned this yet, but when I was thinking about sort of positive customer experience, I guess I was thinking about on time performance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's one of probably one of the key things that makes it easy for easier for people to utilize the system is confidence that, you know, when they, 
when they when they need to travel uh, that they know that when they show up at the at the train station or the bus stop that they have a high level of confidence that the bus or the train is going to arrive when RTD says it's going to arrive. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Deborah, I see you unmuted yourself. If I can just add to that, and thank you, Ron, um, I appreciate that. And it's really interesting when we look at this, I would just ask as you go forward, recognizing that different transit agencies um, define on-time performance sometimes differently. And so to a customer, um, when you say on-time performance, we could be on time by our key performance indicator, but we could be late to the customer's point of view. So just in my experience, you could be measuring two different things because in some in some facets like we do here, it's minus one plus five. And for those of you who don't understand what I'm saying is you have a specific time point and you could be early up, you know, a minute early and you could be up to five minutes late, but you're still on time. And if somebody needs to bust at 202 and you arrive at 207, technically we're still on time, but we have met, met the needs of the customer. So that's when I, you bring it full circle to customer satisfaction versus the experience. So to what Elise said, there's interdependencies as you look at all this holistically. So while ridership and OTP could be one aspect of a metric, it's not the only aspect of a metric. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for sharing. It's definitely an important point when collecting these measures to define what they mean and how they are collected and also how they're calculated. Mm -hmm. um, so you bring up an excellent point that agencies do define on-time performance in different ways, and it does mean something different to the customer. I was just going to add, I mean, in, in just reading the question, what is RTD here to do? Like, just basically, basic answer to that question. One thing I hear a lot of time from, from communities that I work in is that RTD is really here to quickly, safely move our region and help us in meeting our goals. And so, like, when I think about how do we, how do we measure whether RTD is safely moving the region or whether they are moving the region, it gets to that on-time performance um, and just breaking it out by route, like by the actual routes and what's their performance look like um, on time, early and um, late, but then also adding that context that Deborah had shared and like, what does that actually mean internally to RTD? So adding that little bit of narrative on how it ultimately, again, affects me as a customer, not just as RTD. Excellent viewpoint. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do want to open it up for a few folks. I haven't heard from a couple, so I, I'm just, I don't want to put folks on the spot, but I am also um, not going to hesitate to put folks on the spot if need be. Uh, Kristen, I'm just kind of curious in, in your view, if you have anything to add in terms of like your perspective, um, what is RTD here to do and, and what are some things that we may want to bring into this conversation? Well, thank you, Dad. Uh, I know that really RTD's primary purpose is to move people. That's why they exist. Uh, my thoughts about that is really moving people the right way. If someone has to make, for example, three transfers to get to work, they are going to drive. If someone with a disability can't get to the high block easily to get onto the light rail, they are going to use Accessorize if they're eligible for that. RTD really needs to focus on, well, not only customer experience, and that's one of the customer experiences that I think people have why they don't use public transportation is how difficult it is. And, and uh, General Manager Johnson, you were right, people don't want to sit in the dark and wait for transportation that they don't know if or when it's going to come. That's really, that really is going to be the, the holy grail is can RTD provide transportation that is reliable, is 
easy to use. Uh, and one of the things that I really focus on is for the transit dependent population, let's make it work for them. Ron, or not Ron, sorry, Ron. Yeah, just to reinforce uh, what Kristen uh, just said about the transit dependent populations, I think that there are great market opportunities for RTD in some of those transit dependent uh, neighborhoods. You know, I'm less worried about uh, Cherry Hills Village being underserved or a transit desert by their standards than I am Swansea, because there are people there that, that really can benefit economically and sociologically and humanly from having really good transit service. And there are data exploration tools, get on my geeky side here, that where you can look at the economics of neighborhoods and then you could look, for example, in how many bus passes there are within those neighborhoods. And there are, you know, there are discounted bus passes. There are a lot of reasons why there could be more. It isn't just the cost of that pass. It's whether people really have access to transit. And that last first last mile is a killer a lot of times to that. And so we could identify opportunities like that, that there may be there may be partnership with TNCs is one of the things I'll talk about at the end that might help us be able to really more effectively serve those. But also remember, you know, assuming that that 1148 or whatever that bill is, uh, House bill passes, the measure is going to be uh, ridership versus operating cost and, and not uh, not just um, the, the idea that we're going to look at fare box ratios. And so finding ways to drive ridership is going to be more and more important. And that's, a, I think, a very important measure, but uh, it's embedded in how well we can serve these underserved populations. Because mm -hmm. they're the biggest market opportunities. They need transit. So a couple of, of metrics that I just want to lift up for members of the committee that were shared with me um, by, by just a couple of different folks that I've had conversations with. Um, and I'm a little surprised it hasn't come up because we've had a lot of conversations around partnerships. <laughs> um, yes. But thinking about the, the, the number of partnerships that RTD enters into um, and thinking about that as a potential metric to just get to your, your point, how are we, how successful are we in, in connecting first and last mile? Whether that's, I don't know that that's a, the right metric, but just something to think about. Like what is that dollar investment and or um, gap that we're filling? Like how much of that gap? Um, again, not, not a perfect measure. One other, um, a couple of other measures that were mentioned, again, as we think about customer service. Um, so the, the percentage of stops with shelters and, and bus or benches. So just again, improving how, what an individual's experience is. And I know that's not fully within RTD's control, but gets back to some of the partnership conversations. Um, average walking distance between stops um, and then lifting up uh, I think what Rut had mentioned earlier around the number of uh, average number of transfer transfers per trip. Um, how how often are people <laughs> transferring, and, and is there a way that we can improve that? Um, and a couple of other folks that I've um, just in my conversations around transit equity I have lifted up the percentage of the population that's served by 15 minute or better frequency of service. Again, getting folks out of their cars and ideally into the transit system. Um, those are just a couple of thoughts that I wanted to throw out for the committee. I also don't want to belabor the point. We have a couple of additional items on the agenda. So I just want to do one last check and see if any if folks have any additional thoughts or reflections kind of based on those metrics that were just shared. Just one other thing. I think in some of these metrics, there's a time of day function. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's good not just to think about what's the average over the service period, but how does it vary uh, by time? If you've got a if you're working in a bar and you know you don't get off work till midnight, then you're you can be out of luck. That's a really good point, Pat. Tanya and Anna. I just want to do a quick check-in because we do have a couple of other items on the agenda that I think we'll have some conversation around, and I want to be mindful. Um, any additional items? Um, no, not not from us. We were just excited to hear from you all today and hear what you um, you know you have to say and. Um, 
you know, certainly inform our, our next steps moving forward. So, so thank you all for that. And I'll, I'll just add briefly, we did have a conversation with Doug McLeod around the dashboard and trying to understand where RTD is um, in terms of, of maturity and, and that. Um, and so RTD's ability to report on these metrics will be another component that we consider um, as we make recommendations. Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, Dan. Bye, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really an outsider and everybody there is much more familiar with the issues surrounding RTD and, and what it does and how efficient it is. And from my perspective, it has an enormous task because of its service area. And when you talk about first and last mile and then all of the other uh, you know, fixed route transit services and rail and what have you, I mean, it's, it's the, the scope of what they do and what they could be doing is enormous and it would require, I think, a tremendous amount of resources for them to, to meet all of the needs and all of the wants and desires of all the people in the region. And I think at some point, you know, RTD needs to really come to terms with what does it want to be when it grows up with the resources that it has? Is it going to try to do a first last mile and, and all of these other things with light rail and fixed bus services and so forth? Or does it need to focus its resources to achieve some of these, these regional goals of reducing carbon emissions and improving air quality and reducing traffic congestion. Um, because otherwise it's, its resources are going to be so uh, you know, widely dispersed that it may not really make anybody happy. Um, they have a, an enormous task over here in our region. We serve a narrow corridor. So people come to us, we don't chase sprawl. Uh, we have uh, one entrance into the city of Aspen and our metric is whether or not the city is able to meet its goal of, of maintaining traffic volumes going into and out of town at 1993 levels, which we've been able to do since 1993 by increasing transit services, by uh, uh, doing other travel demand management techniques and so forth. And I, I just think that you have an enormous challenge over there, but ultimately you have to kind of focus your efforts and your resources on what it is that you think is the most important thing to do. That is a very important, important point. And uh, Tanya, I see you unmuted yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to I want to thank you for for sharing that with us. Um, and and you're absolutely right. There, this is a tremendous task for RTD, and um, you know, really the impetus of our question. Um, so if RTD is here to do all of these things um, with the resources they have, what can they reasonably do well? And so understanding, um, you know, what these, the, the folks represented here today are valuing will, will help us um, shape those, those recommendations. So thank you. Yeah. So um, I just want to, to kind of wrap up this conversation before I turn it back over to Rut for for the committee's um, just notification, I, I, we I wanted to share that um, this conversation I don't is not intended to be the last. Obviously, there's going to need to be some additional work um, with the North Highlands team, and then certainly with the finance committee. Um, what Matthew is sharing is a very very draft version of um, essentially feedback and insights that I have received from members of the committee, members of the operations committee, I should say. Um, in terms of the two buckets that we discussed last time. So we talked about um, the goal of improving efficiency of RTD and then improving effectiveness. Those are by no means the, the perfect measures and really the intent of today's conversation is to get some level of clarity on wh where might we have some consensus. Again, answering that big question, what could RTD reasonably do well? Um, so this is really intended to just kind of give us some, some additional things to um, chomp on to kind of get get the, the creative juices flowing and just um, offer up something that could potentially be a recommendation to RTD. Again, reiterating the earlier point, the purpose of the committee is to provide recommendations and is really up to RTD and, and the leadership of um, General Manager Johnson to, to in the, the board to determine how and, and what makes the most sense for the organization, especially in acknowledgement that they are going through a strategic planning process. So 
this um, will be shared with the committee afterwards, but I, I wanted to at least share um, with you all some, some insights and some feedback that I've received um, from folks on potential uh, metrics or things that we may wanna measure, but we still have to answer this bigger question, I think ultimately, so. With that, um, we do have one other item on the agenda. Rhett, I wanna check in with you and see if you're ready. I'm ready. All right, take it over. So um, I wanna talk about a concept uh, for first last mile, but it's also a concept for a lot of other things beyond just first last mile. The, you know, if you look at what all the partnerships and the discussion of those, first last mile is certainly probably top of the list, but there are also issues in people with disabilities that uh, some of this uh, uh, overlaps with. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, I come from a business background. So it, it's, it's really a lot about market. You know, uh, RTD is more and more gonna be uh, driven or measured by how much ridership they have. Are there some underserved markets that RTD could get greater access to? And how would it go about doing that? But can we create a model for partnerships that really transfers well through a lot of, of different areas? And, you know, if you look at first last mile, you know, if you, if you wanna to try to find, and my goal was saying, is there a way that we could provide first last mile rides for free? You've really gotta drive down deep on how you cut costs. And so I'll be talking a lot about uh, the cost part of it, but if you, if you wanna look at, at what some of the, the keys are uh, to minimizing cost, first off, what I'm talking about here is, is, a, is a partnership between RTD and transportation network companies. When I say TNCs, I don't mean just Uber and Lyft. You know, there, there are others like VIA that are, that are potential partners and there'll be some new entrants in this market uh, more and more, uh, uh, including some new technologies like autonomous vehicles. If, if we have a sufficiently restricted area that they're going in, they could potentially have a role to play in that too. Not yet, but, but not too many years down the road. So, um, what are some of the keys to really minimizing cost? Well, the, the model I'm gonna talk about is not a door-to-door -door service model. It is a uh, corner, street, street corner or whatever, or nearest or near street corners. It's basically defining a route and then picking people up along that route for the most part. Maybe also with some uh, community locations where people can gather and, and that have places to park. Uh, and it's shared rides. It has to be shared rides for a lot of reasons. Environmental reasons, yes, but also cost reasons. It's gotta be, it's gotta operate efficiently with minimum dwell time. When that RTD driver picks a person up, it's gotta happen quickly that that person's verified that they're allowed to have the ride and, and then it goes ahead. And then one of the big things is that, is that the model that I'm working from, uh, and this is several months of work, uh, ultimately comes down to not just providing this for anybody that walks up and wants to catch a ride, but focusing on it as a benefit for, for people who are regular transit users. And so part of the key to it is if you take a, a transit pass, if you have a transit pass, then you're eligible for this service. And that's particularly critical in these underserved areas where right now there aren't a lot of, necessarily aren't a lot of RTD users. So we have to create it as a way that we're going to be able to find those underserved areas and then be able to pull riders in for RTD. So the, if you have a pass, for example, that has a QR code on it, that could be linked to a database that says this is a current pass and this person is eligible to, to use this free ride benefit. And there may be a way to charge people for if, if they're not regular users or if they're not transit pass holders. But what we're trying to do is get to something that makes people want to be RTD, regular RTD customers. So the real focus is on, on transit dependent communities. I mentioned Swansea and, 
in uh, in communities like that, that, you know, they're really, there may be some bus service, but when the RTD stations for light rail, for example, were being laid out, those weren't necessarily the key locations for, for stations. So we need to, we need to find those areas first and then figure out how we could create some pilot programs. Any of the stuff I'm talking about here, it's got to be piloted. Uh, it's got to, uh, also have community input before even those pilots are put together. But we've got to, we've got to test ideas. It's not going to work the first time. There's going to be a lot of things that you have to continue to, to change in order to make it successful. But if we can get the dwell times down on the cars, really down to where he just takes a, the driver, just takes a phone and takes a picture of that, uh, of that Q, QR code, and then boom, that's a time and date stamped, I picked this person up, then the dwell times are, are really quite minimal. If they don't have to drive all the way through the neighborhoods to pick people up, the dwell times are minimal. So um, I, I uh, also wanna say that, uh, that there's a great opportunity in this to, to maximize partnerships, not just with TNCs, but also with employers, uh, large employers within a region to connect people in these underserved neighborhoods to, for example, a light rail train that will get them quite near where those, where those other opportunities are, or with the communities uh, that are, that these underserved areas are, are within. So free is hard to get to, but, uh, but I think I've built a model here where if you look, for example, our current First last mile is, is flex ride for the most part. For the cost of the subsidies, which is about $22.60 uh, per, and this is 2019 pre pandemic numbers uh, per single flex ride passengers, where we'd be able to essentially, with that kind of expenditure, get about five times as many people uh, on a, a service like this free ride service. So it's low-income Coloradans, mostly in underserved communities, and who are most in need of dependable access to education, training, and better paying jobs. Sometimes within these communities, you're kind of trapped. You can only work at a place that you can walk to if you have no other alternatives for transit. So it's also something that can help us get back to restore uh, the ridership to pre-pandemic levels. And how soon we can do that when we're finally past COVID is, is going to be critical. And also how we get people from SOVs and into transit. So the idea is to create this model and to create some pilots to test this model and then to figure out how to make this model work better and to improve it. You never get it right the first time. But but basically the focus would be rail stations and perhaps those rail stations, which really, we built some rail stations that the ridership is really not coming close to meeting expectations. So if we look at underserved communities in that vicinity, we could also to some degree uh, try, to, try to address that issue. Um, but, but it's not a door to door service. So uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the displays, can I get a display of, of this part up, um, like the Elvira Swansea El Illyria Swansea free free lift route. Good. So basically, from where the station is here, it's going to go around a loop. In this case, both of these are about four mile loops. There's one for Aurora Hills also that's that's displayed here, and so. Within that time, a, a, a TNC driver could make a loop in less than 15 minutes, say. So they might get four loops in uh, in an hour at, at, uh, at especially at rush hour times. And, and so they would pick up, say they picked up three passengers uh, and, uh, and then they basically provide them with that free ride to the station. Now people are not gonna get a door-to-door -door service. They're gonna have to walk a few blocks down to where there's a major intersection that's on this loop, but it's free. So, you know, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, 
if you if you look at the locations, the idea is to focus it within fairly dense communities where there are a lot of uh, potential candidates for services like this. Um, but uh, if you if you expand the model and you look at how it might be used, the same model can be used, for example, uh, for uh, bus rapid transit in terms of getting people from that community in. So, so here are here are a couple of examples of that those kind of loops. Um, it's it's really important that you be able to get people on and off as quickly as possible as well. Uh, dwell time matters, um, but it's it's high density areas. Potentially, it's a win for customers and RTD because RTD will essentially sell more bus passes and have more regular customers and that that ultimate ridership measure that's going to be increasingly important this is a way to begin to recover that ridership so i go through some examples in here you're not always going to have three riders but you may also have people with larger vehicles that are providing these services so it might be more than three riders you know in a van you could get quite a bit more so you, you've got to create a target rich environment. And this is from a, from, a art, from a TNC driver's perspective, the value of this is they've got a target rich environment to get these rides. Instead of driving around in, in circles and burning gasoline, they're basically going over these loops and, and uh, serving those people. So it's, it is a way to give RTD market access to underserved neighborhoods and drive transit ridership, uh, communities are bypassed by, uh, communities bypassed by station location decisions are now gonna get access. And there are really very little in the way of capital cost and the operating costs are shared by hopefully employers and local government in partnerships. And the model, and, and some of this is instead of the kind of very high, uh, uh, very high cost that we're experiencing right now with our first last efforts, mile efforts in terms of subsidies. If, <clears throat> so there is a second part to this, and that is if you if you look at people with disabilities, there are there are people who really need accessoride, who need a wheelchair that's motorized, that's requires a lift. But there are also an awful lot of people with more moderate disabilities who, uh, who may be what, what you could, uh, what you could describe as people who have mobility limitations, but they are otherwise capable of, of getting around in moderate distances. Um, people may have, uh, uh, you know, for, for some people, the idea of being able to get a free ride all the way through, anything we can do that will encourage them to do that, as opposed to our current subsidies for accessor rider, uh, as of 2019, it was $48.44 a ride just for the subsidy part. So um, if, if you look at those kinds of costs, uh, then if we can find a, a way that they still have a choice of accessor ride, but they may want to choose an alternative that costs less. It may be very cost effective to provide them with free bus passes and, and free metro passes, free free RTD passes through the system, plus free free lift services. They may choose to take free lift instead of accessor ride uh, if it's not a big burden for them to walk five four blocks four or five blocks down to the to where that uh, TNC is passing by. Um, so again, you know, I keep talking about cost, but ultimately if we're gonna make this free, we've gotta figure out where the money's coming from. And this is all part of where the money's coming from. So for these mobility limited customers, this could be sort of a bridge. There's also a potential for what I call free lift plus, <clears throat> which is a door to station sort of service but it's for people with walkers and for people with foldable wheelchairs. So you can go pick them up there. The drivers would be trained to store those and then bring them to the, to the light rail station. Maybe a maximum of two people per, per pickup. So that's a, that's a broad 
brush look at this. There are a lot of details to work out still. Uh, I really encourage anyone who has an interest in this to send me an, an email and uh, or call me and, uh, and provide your input and your ideas. It is early stage. This is the first real draft. So uh, we hope that we can evolve this into something that's practical and that will work for a lot of people. So that's it. That's all I had to say about it. I do have another example on here on uh, how it might work for Longmont in terms of uh, feeding into that first and main tra transit station, whether it's BRT or whether it's eventually a rail line. So I'd love to have comments, questions, whatever. Anybody? <laughs> Yes, Elise. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for all the work you did on this. And I, I think, um, you know, focusing on first and final mile partnerships is a, is a key area of work. So this is super helpful to kind of move that conversation forward. I'm curious if Deborah is still on um, or someone else from RTD, what comments that they might have on this? Because I'm sure that they've um, done some work on this arena as well. Yes, thank you, Elise, I'm here. So recognizing, I think if anything, as we talk about you know, um, the aspect of first and last mile, and I appreciate what Red had to say, I think you know, it's basically discerning what it is that we need to do and we're examining a myriad of things. So recognizing it's gonna be more or less indigenous to the area and the customer segment in which we're trying to serve. I am a proponent of looking to see how we might leverage a model that would be advantageous for this area, uh, because as we talk about these components, it's about moving people. As as and as we heard from North Highlands, you know, when we're when we're trying to discern what it is that we need to do, we need to ensure that we're enhancing the customer experience. So looking at those customer segments. So just off the top of my head, that's sort of a roundabout answer. But really, wanting you all to know that we're opening to open to. Um, discerning what might be the best model forward contingent upon those aspects relative to the traveling experience of those who need to get where they need to go when they need to get there and recognizing that we're in the throes of reimagine RTD, which will enable us to really look at a comprehensive transportation network and identify the optimal mobility solutions. So I think through all of these efforts collectively, we will be able to pinpoint what might work best. And then again, going back to what I said before, asking the customers, those that really need the service, what it is that they need and what might be advantageous for that demographic. Does that answer your question? Um, Seems like I was rambling. <laughs> no, it wasn't rambling. It was very useful. And, and, okay. and again, oftentimes uh, these things aren't decided just by somebody going off and inventing ideas. It, it really takes focus groups and it, it takes uh, getting connected to the people who potentially could be the beneficiaries to, to determine what we, what we really need to do going forward. And I look at my watch and guess what? <laughs> Our time's up, I probably talked too long. But um, Dave, do you have any closing comments? Do you have anything you wanna say before we call it? I do not, thank you. Thank you, Rep, for co-hosting this with the operations committee. <laughs> and Dan, Dan and I, and, and hopefully uh, Julie and governance as well, will work together on these ideas. Dan has already provided some input. Kristen has, I hope to get some from the rest of you as well. Okay, uh, with that, we will call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thanks Thank everyone you, for being here.